purpose of screening is to detect cancers early. And the purpose of detecting cancers early is to try to save lives. So one of the problems with lung cancer now is that we haven't had a means of early detection. And because of that, the majority of cancers are diagnosed at late stage when the chance of cure or even long-term survival is poor. And so the hope for screening for lung cancer is that we will increase the number of patients who are diagnosed at early stage where we have a good chance of curing that patient and increasing their survival and decreasing their mortality from lung cancer. Well, we have some recent evidence actually from a very big study that uh, shows that there's a pretty dramatic reduction in deaths from lung cancer with low-dose CT screening. We've been trying to develop a screening test for lung cancer for a long time, for many decades, but we finally actually have a screening test that works. Uh, this is pretty new information and so we're just trying to figure out how do we actually implement this and, and make it work for us. The National Lung Screening Trial, the NLST, was a really big trial. Uh, over 53,000 patients, a really big uh, uh, trial. Used low-dose CT screening uh, on an annual basis for people that are at uh, relatively high risk of lung cancer and found a pretty dramatic reduction, a 20% reduction in lung cancer deaths for those people that were screened on an annual basis. The National Lung Screening Trial is limited to a specific population and the criteria for entry for the study were age 55 to 74 years, the ability to tolerate a thoracic surgery if it were necessary, and 30 pack years of smoking, and if the uh, individual had quit, they had to have quit within 15 years of entry into the study. So we know that the results of the NLST are generalizable to that population. The limitations are, what about everybody else? And so if an individual does not fit into the criteria that were used by the NLST, you really can't apply the results of the study that 20% reduction in mortality from lung cancer to them. The obvious benefit to screening is if you can diagnose lung cancer early and therefore treat it effectively and be able to cure it. Uh, and certainly, you know, lung cancer is, a, you know, the major cause of cancer mortality and a major problem mainly because in many patients we don't find it until it's very advanced when we can't cure it. You have to remember that screening is applied to just sort of a normal population, so people that are healthy don't have anything wrong with them and are walking down the street. So if you do have a problem, you know, it's a bit of a different issue. Uh, one of the other problems with CT screening is that you pick up a lot of little findings, little nodules, the vast majority of them are not lung cancer, they're just normal, but you have to sort that out. And so depending on how you sort that out, you certainly could cause problems in people that are otherwise you know, healthy and there's nothing wrong with them. There are 10 components of an ideal lung cancer screening program. They include, first, a personalized risk evaluation and clinical assessment. Second, counseling and education of the screening process. Third, discussion of the risks and benefits of screening. Fourth, shared decision making to acknowledge an individual's concerns related to screening. Fifth, understanding personal fears and motivators. Sixth, smoking cessation counseling and treatment for current smokers. Seventh, low-dose CT scan if indicated. Eighth, low-dose CT scan interpretation by a dedicated multidisciplinary team of specialists. Ninth, longitudinal surveillance and follow-up according to evidence-based practice. And tenth, ongoing data collection and quality assessment to refine the screening process. The integration of all of these components is key in delivering appropriate screening care to those who most benefit. Well, screening is really 
an interplay of a lot of different factors and it's a process. So it depends on, you know, what your risk of developing lung cancer is. It depends on how you interpret findings on the CT scan. Remember there are a lot of little ditzels that are nothing, that are not important, that you have to sort through. Uh, it depends on uh, what sort of interventions you do uh, with the things you do need to follow up on. Uh, it depends on whether people follow up with their screening tests. It depends on an interplay of a lot of different factors. And so it's not just one thing, it's this interplay that's the crucial part of it. As the coordinator of the Yale Lung Screening and Nodule Program, I am intimately involved in organizing and managing all aspects of our program, both administratively and clinically. I am responsible for a patient's care from the moment they contact our program, throughout their evaluation, and at the time of follow-up. I make sure that the clinical team has a working knowledge of why the patient wants to get screened for lung cancer and what their estimated lung cancer risk may be based on various risk prediction models. I participate in the shared decision-making process and also educate patients and their families about the lung cancer screening process. I manage all our community referrals for screening and pulmonary nodule evaluations. Overall, I act as the cornerstone of our team, integrating evidence-based lung cancer screening care and pulmonary nodule evaluations into practice. Smoking cessation is included in lung scan, uh, the lung scanning program because smoking is the leading cause of lung cancer. And when people are at the screening program, it provides us with the optimal moment to talk with people about the importance of smoking cessation and that it's the best thing that they can do to help prevent lung cancer. It has been shown that it is very effective to just do brief counseling about smoking cessation. So for physicians to start talking with people about smoking cessation is one of the best things that they can do. In combination with that, the second thing would be to let them know about some of the FDA approved medications for smoking cessation. And then the third thing would be to get them hooked up with either a national uh, quit line service or in our case, we have a smoking cessation program, so getting them referred to a program that specializes in smoking cessation. So those three things combined would be great. The benefit of quitting smoking is that the longer one is abstinent from smoking, the lesser their risk is for developing a lung cancer or a smoking-related disease. There's a spectrum of risk within the NLST, and we don't really know exactly what it means to screen people at the low end of that spectrum or the high end of that spectrum. Now, when you get on and beyond that, people outside of that risk, I think that's where, you know, we really don't have a lot of, we don't have data that screening is really worthwhile on those people. Decision support is a service that's available to patients and physicians to help with decisions that are much more complicated. Um, the idea is to actually have pa patient-centered care so patients are able to participate in uh, the decision making, particularly with more complex decisions. Decision support uh, is important in lung cancer screening um, because uh, the, the lung cancer screening itself is the benefits are clear for patients that meet the, the NLST criteria. However, for those patients that don't meet uh, NLST but do have risk factors, it's not clear whether or not those patients will, will benefit from the lung cancer screening or will they just actually see the harms uh, of the radiation. In those areas, uh, we have something called decision conflict whereby we're not sure which way the patient should proceed. This actually, decision support, what it does is it explores patients' concerns about making the decision. It explores also who's going to help them make the decision. And it allows physicians to sort of hone in on the points that, that are sort of driving the decision and help educate the patient so that they can really participate and have an informed decision. A low-dose CT scan was developed initially for screening patients looking for nodules, tumors, or lung cancers in the lung. The name low-dose is probably 
a misnomer as even during the period while the low-dose lung cancer screening trials were being conducted, the dose was decreased in terms of techniques used by one-third. So it's a moving target and probably a better term would be for this technique that we're using in this project to call it a screening CT or maybe even a task specific CT. We always want to use as little radiation as possible but if for instance you wanted to image the heart or you want to image blood vessels within the thorax you would need to use a higher dose because the inherent difference in density or contrast between blood vessels and muscle, for instance, is much less than the inherent difference in density between contrast of nodules in the lung, which is the equivalent of a muscle density, or, uh, and the air in the lung. So you're, you can use a much lower dose of radiation looking for nodules in the lungs. If you want to look for other structures in the lungs or evaluate a different disease process, such as interstitial lung disease, which can be caused by a variety of agents but and can cause significant disability, you would have to use a higher radiation dose in order to delineate those fine structures. The dose equivalents are for a chest x-ray uh, compare it compared to a low dose CT is about 10 chest x-rays and a conventional or standard dose CT is about three times higher than that or 30 chest x-rays. So the doses are small but they are different and if you're doing a screening study if you can decrease the dose for your specific task as we can looking for nodules in the lungs that decreases the risk to the patient and increases the possible benefits to the patient. Everybody is exposed to a background of radiation for being living in this planet. When you go to see a physician, you are concerned about either that you have a nodule or a cancer, and that's the main goal of a low-dose CT of the chest. It's a screening tool to look for early cancers disease in your chest. So every time you have any radiologic test, either a chest x-ray or a chest CT, you really want to see if the disease is there. So a day by day in medical imaging, you are weighing the benefits and risks of every single procedure, not just a radiologic test, but like an invasive test. When you, if you are a patient that are at risk of having a lung cancer, if you smoke and there are several criteria to define that. So if you are a high risk patient, you will be better off having a low dose chest CT because the benefits of doing that and detecting an early malignancy will be much higher than not doing the test and having a lung cancer develop it and maybe dying from it or having other problems secondary to that. So you're always weighing the risks and benefits of radiation in any medical imaging. In this case, in specific case of low dose CT screen, if you are, if it is indicated for you, so that's another point, not everybody should get a lung CT screening. If it is indicated for you, the benefits outweigh the risks of a very low exposure of radiation. Again, the quality depends on what tissues you're imaging. And the lungs are very easy to image because there's soft tissue density, a nodule, a tumor, it's like a piece of muscle or soft tissue versus the air that's in the lung. The difference in those radiographic densities or contrasts is very large, so you don't need a lot of radiation to distinguish between the two structures. Um, the low dose is excellent for looking for nodules and it's okay for looking at soft tissues in the chest, such as uh, lymph nodes or some of the cardiac structures. The problem with low dose is that it's a very noisy kind of imaging so that its edges are not particularly sharp when you're trying to distinguish one soft tissue from another and it's particularly difficult if you're trying to distinguish linear structures. So in the lung when you're looking for something such as 
a scarring process, a linear process, a fibrotic process such as interstitial lung disease, which is a common set of lung diseases caused by lots of different factors, those are not imaged very well with low dose CT and you have to use higher doses of radiation in order to image those structures. We're not really very interested in those structures when we're doing screening CT. We're only interested in parenchymal nodules and adenopathy. Of course, when the radiologist reviews the low dose CT, they have to look at all those structures and if you see something in the mediastinum or the central part of the thorax that you think might be abnormal, then you would use another kind of technique or a standard dose CT uh, to further evaluate those structures. The other thing that low dose CT is not as good for is looking for what are called cysts in the lung, which is a collection of air in the lung surrounded by a thin, very thin wall. The air, because the image is noisy, it makes imaging of the cysts difficult, again like fine linear structures. So for that, again, you'd use a different uh, CT technique. So again, the bottom line is tailor your dose to what you're trying to image. And with the screening CTs, the lowest possible dose is lower than for other tasks that CT has to accomplish. So it benefits the patients by a lower radiation dose and decreases the risk of the exam. Our radiology department performs all the CT scans based on the guidelines of the American College of Radiology. As a ACR accredited institution, we have to do fentanyl calibration every morning. So what happens is the physicists and the technicians go to the CT scanner and they scan a water fenton to make sure the quality is good. That's for any CT scan. When you're talking specifically about a low dose screening CT of the lungs, what we do is before, during, and after the acquisition of the images, we perform specific quality control procedures. Before we acquire the image, we make sure that the numbers, the radiation numbers that we input in the CT scanner are adequate to provide the lowest possible exposure to the patient. During the acquisition, we make sure to educate our techs to talk to the patients and click the right buttons so they don't expose the patient for any more than necessary. After we acquire the images, we look at the images and make sure there is no noise that would preclude a diagnostic study. We make sure the quality is adequate to visualize nodules or masses within the lung parenchyma, and then we always look at the amount of radiation that that specific patient was exposed to to make sure there was no mistakes. So it's a continuum effort. We have the basic CT ACR guidelines that takes care of the CT scan, but for a specific low-dense CT screen, we make sure that we do a pre, during, and post-procedure quality control. Fortunately, when screening is done in the population defined by the NLST or actually any of the large screening studies that have been done around the world, there's a very high likelihood that an abnormality, and specifically small pulmonary nodules, will be identified. Uh, we know that in the NLST at the baseline study, 26 to 27 percent of the study subjects actually had at least one pulmonary nodule identified, and at um, the second annual repeat, another 17 percent of patients actually had a new abnormality identified. And so it is very likely that a nodule will be found in a population that is screened. We know from the male screening study that was done about 10 to 15 years ago that at the end of their five years of screening, and their criteria were um, slightly less smoking than the NLST, 70% of their study population at the end of five years had actually had at least one abnormality identified. So unfortunately, it is very likely that a nodule will be found if we screen. And that's why it is so important that a comprehensive nodule program be embedded into the screening program. It is really important that uh, there be adequate follow-up for any screening study that is done because of the likelihood that an abnormality will be found, if not at the baseline screen, then in yearly screenings thereafter. And so a comprehensive nodule program, preferably 
that is also part of a thoracic oncology program needs to be an integral part of any screening program. And the implication of that is there is expertise to determine the likelihood that any given abnormality found on screening is a cancer, what the appropriate follow-up should be, or when an invasive intervention is warranted. First of all, there are a lot of nodules that are benign, the vast majority, and are not lung cancer. But even with those nodules that are lung cancer, there are some that are pretty slow growing and not aggressive and some that are very aggressive. And so you really want to be able to kind of understand what it is you're dealing with and kind of tailor your interventions appropriately to, to what needs to be done for that. Screening is really not just getting a scan, it's a whole process of you know, assessment of risk and then you find little findings, you have to sort through what to do with them. Do you need to biopsy? Do you not need to biopsy? How do you do that? And so that really requires the expertise of a lot of different people. It requires expertise of a pulmonologist, a radiologist, a, a surgeon, an uh, interventional person, a, you know, a variety of different people that all have their own areas of, of expertise.